Good morning, East Bay. What is happening in Alameda, Contra Costa, and Solano counties? Learn about what's happening in our communities and in depth conversation so you know what's going on. We're talking to government, economic, political, nonprofit, and business leaders here in the greater East Bay. I'm Jared Ash, the host of the Capstone Conversation. Welcome to the Capstone Conversation. I'm your host, Jared Ash. Thank you for joining us today. This month, we're doing actually a three-part series on community colleges and local education. We have three guest speakers coming. Tom Epstein, who is with the California Community College Board, the Chancellor of the Contra Costa Community College, a Program Director from Solano Community College, talking about how they have a four-year program in life sciences, creating jobs and partnering with companies from South San Francisco up at a four-year program, which is unique for a community college. So we're going to kick that series off with Tom here. So welcome, Tom. Thanks for joining me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Jared. Yeah, I'm on the California Community College's Board of Governors. I've been on by, for 10 years, originally appointed by Jerry Brown and reappointed by Governor Newsom. And prior to that, I had a long history in politics, public affairs, communications from Sacramento to D.C. and back, and have always been really interested in public policy. And I, I currently serve also as the chair of the board of the Coalition for Clean Air, and I'm a senior fellow at the UCLA School of Public Affairs. That's great. Appreciate some of your background. So the first big question is, what does the board do? How does it relate to the community college system? What do you guys oversee? Educate us a little bit about it. So there are 18 members of the uh, statewide board of governors, and we oversee all the 114 colleges in a way that we provide the all the funding that the state provides to the system, which is over $12 billion this year. And we establish regulations that set standards for that, that all the colleges need to follow. We set up programs to encourage the colleges to pursue certain strategies that we have found to be effective. We provide a lot of technical assistance to the colleges, but all the colleges, of course, are governed by elected boards. Here in Contra Costa, we have a five-member elected board that makes all the day-to-day -day decisions and does all the hiring and so forth. But we, we basically, at the state level, do policy, finance, regulations, and, and advice. That's helpful just to frame it. What are the priorities of the board when you look ahead to the next two to five years? Well, the uh, our board just recently hired a new chancellor, Sonia Christian, who is really a dynamo and, and brings a lot of energy. She came from the Kern County District. And we created what we're calling Vision 2030. And the idea is to really encourage many more students to attend community college to complete their their studies and whatever their goal is, whether that be a certificate for a career education or a two-year degree or a degree in, to, in order to transfer to a four-year college. One of our uh, top priorities, we have a bunch of priority uh, populations. One are, uh, the, the highest one is probably at this point the 6.8 million Californians aged 25 to, to 54 that uh, have uh, graduated high school, but have no college uh, certificate or degree. And California's goal under the governor is to provide 70% of them with a degree or certificate. And we're, we're trying to do that by giving them credit for what they've learned on the job. Sometimes you can get college credits for what you've learned, whether it be military service or in other work that you've done. We're providing more flexible scheduling so that so that learners can take uh, classes uh, in the evening or at any time that's convenient for them uh, online instead of having to come into the to the college to do so. We're also uh, doing a pilot program with the United Domestic Workers Union, where a lot of most of those workers do not have uh, any kind of college credential, and we're working with the union to provide flexible training for them so that the flexible classes so that they can get degrees. We're also doing outreach to veterans, to to justice-involved students, 
And we're another innovative program is dual enrollment, where we're trying to work with high schools to get high school students to enroll in community college classes. And our, our goal is to have all high school students that complete 12 units of college credit while they're in high school. When they start in high school to join a community college, they tend to, in much higher numbers, go to college and get their degree. So that's something that we're really focused on. So when you're doing that level of outreach, your veterans make sense. There's a connection through military and veteran services, high school students through partnerships with the high schools. How are you reaching out to the rest of the population in that 25 to 55 age range? Well, we do a lot of things that, you know, we do the traditional marketing and social media and that sort of thing, but we also reach out to, to people that are working through, through the unions, as I, as I mentioned, and, and through the, the, the special programs that, that, that are provided for them. As I said, we also, for instance, have a program for foster youth that we, that we you know, engage with those, you know, they're all kind of in the system in some way or another, and we try to, to, to reach them through that. So there's a variety of ways. And it's in terms of just the ones that are not affiliated with anything, we just try to get the word out. We have a program called I Can Go to College that, that we do advertising and social media on uh, and as a podcast that tries to reach you know, working people who, who have never you know, been to college before or haven't completed college. That way so it's it's a variety of ways it's and you know it's even you know word of mouth and each each college district has its own understanding of their community and and is able to do outreach in ways that are most appropriate to you know to the community that they are they're in that's great and we'll pull up the information and i can go to college and put that in the show notes for people who are interested so they could pull it up on their app High school students coming in and doing a year of this while in school, how does that work, right? There is high school requirements they have. Um, are we talking about going to their campus on a high school campus? Or are you talking about them having to drive to the community college? How does that work and what's the benefit uh, for the high school students? We try to do both, actually. There are college classes that can be taken while at the high school. And it's not all 12 in one semester. You know, it's it's over a period of years. You can start even as early as ninth grade. And the so sometimes community college professors will actually go to a high school and teach there. Sometimes high school teachers, if they have a master's degree, can teach the college course on campus or the students can go to the community college campus and and take classes there or even sometimes online as well. What's the big benefit for the high school students? I know you mentioned that they are more likely to go to college, right? They're sitting on 12 credits. Does that save them a lot of money going through? Who pay is that program free? Is it they're more likely to get into a bigger name school because they already have those credits and it becomes partly transfer? Yeah, the dual enrollment is free for the high school students. And the most important thing is it, it proves to them that they're college material. You know, a lot of students, particularly first generation students, don't know if they're really able to, to do college. And once they get the confidence that they can pass college courses, they're much more likely to, to enroll and to persevere and actually to have success. So it's really important to, to fill that gap. There's so many students who never, who never get a degree. As I said, there's over 6 million in California over the age of 25. And it's really important to give kids coming out of commits that are in high school or coming out of high school, the confidence that they can, they can make it. And, and all the data shows that it really is a key indicator of success. Yeah, and I think I learned in the recording of the Contra Costa one, their average age student in Contra Costa is 28 at the college. And I think Solano and Alameda, it's actually higher. Uh, so shows yeah, you it's, it's more than people just coming out of high school and going in. Right. About 60% uh, of our students are under the age of 25, but 40% are over. So yeah, that gives you an idea. I mean, it's lifelong learning for sure. Let's... Look at COVID and its impact on the community college system. We know classes were closed, things went online, enrollment dropped tremendously, right? People had to do what 
take over childcare, work had shifted. How has enrollment picking back up? What is the long-term impacts and lessons learned on the community college system from COVID? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we really took a hit uh, when COVID came on. Um, we lost, uh, depending on which college or district, we lost between 10 and 20% of, of our enrollment. Um, well, the biggest thing we learned was that the community colleges were not really well prepared for online learning. There only about half the colleges even had an online program. We have a statewide system where you can take uh, a student can take classes from any college in the system, but it was not robust. It was not able to manage, you know, a huge influx of people, and and a lot of the professors hadn't really ever thought about teaching online, so they they weren't up to date on on the right methods. So one thing that that we've done is is created a much more robust online program. Now it still has a ways to go, but but that's uh, that's helpful, but. The other really important thing was after the initial year of COVID, which was really devastating, there had been a ton of outreach to try and bring people back in, particularly students who were already enrolled or people coming who had just come out of high school who never bothered to enroll. And they did all sorts of things in it from, from phone calling to public meetings to a lot of social media to try and bring those students back. And we're having some success. The enrollment now is is back up to 1.9 million statewide, which which is by the way the highest, the largest system of higher education in America, with 116 colleges, and and so it's been steadily growing since probably the, the fall semester of of 2021, and and we're hopeful to get back. Up. We were up at, at one point at about 2.1 million, and we'd hopefully we'd like to get back to that. Now another another issue though is that fewer uh, people are are graduating from high school that, you know, California is not gaining population anymore. And so there are, there are fewer younger students now. And that's one of the reasons that we're so focused on the older population that never, never able to get a degree. So you, you talked a little bit there about how California is the largest in size. How do we compare to other states, right? We hear a lot of businesses leaving California, for Texas and Arizona and other states, other than our size, how does California community colleges compare and compete with those other states? Well, I mean, California community colleges are the best bargain in education in America. Half the students don't pay any tuition. And, you know, one out of every five community college students in the country is a California community college student. So even though we're about 10% of the national population, we're 20% of the community college population. It's a huge system. It's the, by far the best in the country in terms of access. You know, there are community colleges everywhere. And in many case, in many smaller communities, they're, you know, one of the largest employers and, and, and a huge economic engine as well as an educational opportunity. And it's particularly important because about 70% of community college students are from diverse ethnic backgrounds and a significant percentage are first generation to go to college. So it's a it's like the first rung on the higher education ladder. There's so many people that whose families had been left behind or had had, had never had the opportunity to get a higher education. So it, it's a hugely important economic and, and opportunity creator in California, uh, unlike anywhere else in the country. That's a, a great answer. Let's talk about how, and I know it's independent to each college, but how do the community colleges work with employers within their communities statewide to build those relationships and make sure we're constantly developing students for, for the future, for the jobs in their community, right? Well, at the state level, we try to, we, we are given a bunch of state money that we then pass through to the colleges. And we've uh, helped to form kind of regional collaboratives, or regional coalitions of employers, unions, and colleges to, to organize it so that like if there are 10 colleges in one region, that employers know which colleges are producing students with this kind of expertise and and that we bring in the right employers to that, that can that can take these students also of course the individual colleges have relationships in their community with employers and they do it 
on a on a one to one basis. Like I've visited colleges where where there you know are let's say a welding program, and they have an employer who you know who who is looking for welders that they work directly with and and send them right there. Um, and I've seen automotive engineering, same thing. They work with local car repair, uh, you know, for uh, uh, some of the big auto companies. And so that kind of thing is going on everywhere. And, 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 you know, there are obviously different types of economies in different regions. And so, you know, in some technology rated areas, like down in, down in the Silicon Valley, of course, there's, there's much more closer relationship with the people looking for you know, cybersecurity graduates and that sort of thing, which the, the community colleges produce quite a few of. Yeah, that's interesting, right? When you're looking at it for statewide perspective, in turn, you might have more energy related employment opportunities where in Silicon Valley, it might be more of that cybersecurity. You might have other areas uh, that are more agriculture engineering yeah. based. In the far north, there's a lot of forestry interaction between the employers and the colleges as well. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Let's talk about homelessness. A report in the LA Times came out in December that talked about a number of students living on college campuses, community college campuses, and four-year universities in California, living in parking lots, creating tents, creating little villages where they could help each other. Give us your perspective on the situation and what the colleges statewide and locally are doing to help their students with the co high cost of living? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'll say that the biggest problem facing most community college students in terms of completing their degrees, being able to take a full course load instead of a partial course load is poverty. They, nearly all students are working sometimes more than one job. A lot of them have families they're taken care of. And you know there has been data that shows that in the neighborhood of 50% of our students are hungry, and as many as you know 30 to 40 suffer periodic homelessness. And so we have a a fairly robust what we call basic needs program where we try and help students who are in that kind of precarious position. But of course, it's not nearly enough. I mean, it's the it's the whole entire state economy that, you know, the, the difference between the haves and the have nots, the inequality and, and most community college students are very low income. And so there have been incidents where some colleges have set up programs where students can sleep in their cars overnight in the school parking lot. Others have rejected that. There's been some state legislation on that as well. But, but, you know, what, what, what we try to do, what the colleges try to do is intervene with people in a particular crisis and help them get through, get through the worst of it. But until we solve the problem of social inequality, there's always going to, I mean, our, our students are going to be the ones right on the bleeding edge of that, of that problem. Let's expand that and discuss diversity at the colleges. Diversity, equity, inclusion is a hot topic. Uh, in a lot of local governments and stuff throughout the state. What can you tell us? What are the colleges trying to do for that? Uh, what kind of programs are they doing? You talked a yeah. little, little bit about it, but explain. Yeah, that. well, about 70% of our students are, are minorities, um, and the uh, a significant percentage of them are Latino. And what we've, we've adopted a very robust DEI program that tries to encourage the colleges to to address the needs that that people from diverse communities have and to ensure that the employees of the colleges are are sensitive to those issues and representative of those communities and as i'm sure you're aware it's become a little bit controversial lately and there's a there's a right-wing campaign to kind of blow up DEI programs around the country. We've we've encountered some, or the system has encountered some lawsuits about it that we are contesting. And but we are completely dedicated to it. All of our programs are designed with equity first, to create as much opportunity as possible for those who have not had those opportunities, and to try and create a an environment where where students from all cultures and backgrounds and races can feel comfortable. And and it's a it's a continuing challenge. Uh, you know, they I, I I I've traveled to fifty colleges. I've I've seen a lot of these places up close, and 
from what I've observed, there's a very, very welcoming environment for for students of all different types and and that the staff is very committed to that. But you know, there still can always be better. And so that's what we're trying to do and you know and have the have the colleges reflect the the types of students that that they that attend there. So you know it's a continuing challenge, and with this assault from the right, that's it it's it's made it even more challenging. And are they just going after the concept of DEI or are there specific elements that it looks like people are attacking with the in California here? Well, in California, it's the regulations that we adopted that set some standards for hiring new faculty and staff that that are being challenged legally. But it's really, I mean, there, there was a big front page New York Times Sunday story a couple of weeks ago that talked about who are the funders are of this nationally and and how they're systematically going out and trying to dismantle you know all these programs that that are designed to increase equity and and an opportunity for people who have been denied it over the years switching to the employees and professors at colleges you have 1.9 million students moving up to to hopefully 2.1 i believe you said that's a lot of employees roughly do you know how many i'm afraid that's that's a Statistic I don't have, but there's a lot. <laughs> As I said, they're in, you know in a lot of communities they're among the biggest employers and certainly have a huge economic impact because of how many students go there. But I will say that you know the the faculty there you know first of all almost all the staff in all these places is unionized. The teachers have a union. The the other workers also have a union, and and so there's generally uh, good working conditions for the people who do work in in the community colleges the the ones that are probably um have the least benefits are are part-time faculty and and more than half of community college uh teachers are are part-time and and so some of them teach at multiple colleges and and so they are you know they're they're kind of the in many ways the backbone of a lot of these academic institutions but but also don't have full-time status anywhere so that's an issue that the state has been trying to to help with the the, the governor and legislature provided several hundred million dollars to provide health care benefits to part-time faculty and that's being implemented but but in terms of of the staffing you know the uh, I think the, the 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 professors I've talked to a lot of students as I said as I've traveled around and they all rave about their professors, about the engagement they get and how committed they are to to seeing their success. And I've, I've talked to plenty of graduates of four-year colleges who say the best teachers they ever had were when they were in community college. I do, I do want to add, too, that almost 30% of, of UC graduates started at a community college and more than 50% of Cal State students started at a community college as well. So it's had a huge impact on the four-year universities. Yeah, good, good partnership. And I looked it up while you were talking there. It's 92,500 approximate employees under the system. So that is, you know, a huge employment network. Is there enough faculty and staff at these schools? I know from a local government perspective, from everything from wastewater to police, people have had shortages over the last two years of employees. Do you guys, does the system overall have enough um, people wanting to be faculty, wanting to be involved in the schools? That's that's a complicated question because, well, first of all, there's a state law saying that all the colleges should try strive to have 70% of their faculty be full-time, and most colleges have not gotten there. They're required to make an effort to do that. And there are plenty of people, I think, who who want to be like a lot of these part-time faculty members would, would like, like to be full-time, but there isn't the funding for that. And yeah, so the biggest challenge is is really, I think, I think there are plenty of people that want to be college faculty, but just, you know, depending on district by district, some just don't have the funding to to continue to add faculty. There, there's also a requirement that 50% of all funding, state funding that comes for community colleges through Prop 98, which was a ballot measure passed many years ago for K through 12 and community colleges, 50% is supposed to be spent on faculty. 
And most, yeah, most colleges, I mean, in fact, I think all the colleges meet that, meet that mark. So, but there are pockets of, of, of types of classes that are for which there aren't enough faculty, for instance, nursing, to be a nursing instructor at a community college, you need to have a master's degree. But if you have a master's degree in nursing, you can make a lot more money working in a hospital or somewhere or somewhere else or, you know, health plan. And so, it, you know, it's sometimes difficult recruiting certain types of professors. Same for, you know, some of the hands-on workforce training. It's hard to find uh, people, people who may have the skills, but don't have the academic credential to teach, like in a, in, in a, in a automotive engineering or whatever it is. So there are, there are certain categories that are a little difficult to find enough teachers for, but the rest of it is really a funding issue. Sure. And I imagine there's some geography traits to it also, right? In some places, mm -hmm. it might be easier for one occupation versus another. And I taught a couple of years ago at UC Berkeley Extension, some political science and government classes and, and love it. And maybe when my kids are older, that'll be something I could do part time again, just because mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed instructors that when I was in college that worked in the legislature that had that hands-on sort of experience, right, uh, came out of the political world. Uh, mm -hmm. I really just enjoyed their perspective on things, even if I disagreed with them politically. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, one, there's one thing I do want to mention. The, uh, under our Vision 2030 that, that, that we've adopted recently, we do have certain priority areas that, that we, I really wanted to mention and also something about what the people listening to this podcast can do to help. You know, our, our workforce training involves, you know, both industry partnerships where, you know, colleges work directly with a, with a certain company or, or set of companies to uh, provide training for, for various skills. And now we also have relationships with unions for apprenticeships that are both, it also are very important. And we're trying to expand apprenticeships greatly in, 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 and into fields that didn't traditionally have apprenticeships, you know, more some of the technology jobs, for, for example. And also our workforce training under our new vision is, is, is focused on, on expanding four areas that we think there are shortages of workers in, including healthcare, climate, STEM, and in education, you know, creating more teachers, as, as we just talked about. And the other thing we're working on in terms of workforce is what's the impact of AI? Uh, obviously, AI affects everything from how we teach to how students learn to how the colleges operate. And it's something that, that we've been doing a series of, of listen, you know, kind of working sessions on to figure out how that's going to happen. And the, and the other, the other thing I just want to do is because you have some listeners, hopefully who are interested, you know, if you're a high school parent or a high school student, you should check out dual enrollment. That's, that's something that would be, it's definitely worth your while. If you're a working adult who, who feels like they need more skills to, to get a, another job that move up the economic ladder, uh, go online to your local college and check out uh, the flexible opportunities that, you know, this credit for prior learning that I mentioned that you might be able to get college credits just for work you've already done, particularly veterans. And if your employer, you know, if you're having trouble filling jobs, I mean, don't, don't just go to LinkedIn, go to your local college, try and, and see if there's a way that, first of all, that there are students coming out that you're missing, or if there are ways you can help influence what, what skills are needed. And if you're just a, an ordinary, you know, resident of the, of the East Bay, you know, support policies and bond measures that come up to help the community colleges. Most of our colleges go to the ballot every five or 10 years and, and seek more money for facilities and, and try and vote and, and vote for those. And finally, you know, if you're a foundation involved with a foundation or you uh, happen to be wealthy, you know, consider donations and contribute to the colleges. I mean, it, 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 I find it appalling. That you know these Ivy League colleges have have endowments in the tens of billions of dollars, and most community colleges, you know, might have a foundation with a couple million dollars. When community colleges are 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 training and educating so many more students than than these than the wealthy schools are, so that's that's something. If you have any particularly foundation listeners, hopefully that would be something they'd consider. I wanted to make sure I got that in before this ended. <laughs> No, that's that's great. And I always ask people, what else do they want to add? And you sort of pick <laughs> that up with those categories and we'll add some of those links to the show notes on the Vision 2030 plan, the dual enrollment, the, mm -hmm. the workforce enrollment as well. So 
it's really helpful to to get that perspective on it. Anything else we should be asking? There's, there's a couple of things we like to say about our, our the, com the community college. First of all, we accept the top 100% of students. You don't need to be afraid to uh, to apply to a community college. It's open admission, and and there are plenty of support structures, and there are lots of counselors. There's a lot of finance. There, there's financial aid available. As I said, half of students don't pay any tuition thanks to a variety of programs, even and, if, and including those who are undocumented. There's financial aid for undocumented students, um, and there's also advice about how to how to obtain other funding. And there is this emergency funding that we talked about, the basic the basic needs. And that the, you know, I think in, in the past, there was sort of an attitude at the community colleges that maybe all the students coming into the colleges weren't college ready. Well, we've totally changed our culture now where the colleges are student ready, regardless of how experienced or how much education you have coming in. The colleges are now focused on making and helping you to succeed. You don't have to worry if you feel like you're underqualified or, you know, or, you know, you, you don't have people at home who understand how to, how to succeed in college. There are people at the college that can help you and that, that you know, don't be afraid. Don't feel like you're not college material. You, that everyone is college material. And if they come into the community colleges, they're going to find a welcoming environment. Yeah, that's actually really good to know, right? It talks about the changes in the system over time, right? That welcomes it and opens it up to everybody. And I'm glad to know at 100% acceptance rate that I could even get in myself. So, uh, <laughs> and, and if I could, I, I just thought of one more thing, if you don't mind. Yeah. There's also a really innovative college as part of the community college system. It's called Calbright College. And oh, yeah. I, I also serve on the board of that. And Calbright is a 100% online college that's, that's designed exclusively for working adults who want to move up the job ladder by getting uh, a credential or, or in, in, in new uh, skills that can help them move up. We have a lot of technology classes that are offered on, on, on Calbright. It's completely free and anybody can sign up. You are given credit for prior learning. You do it at your own pace. You can take you know, two months to complete your certificate, or you can take two years. It's it, it is flexible and and designed. You, you can you can do it at midnight. It's there are not online tests. It, it's it's a skills based approach, and so it's it adds a whole new dimension. And, and we think it's very innovative, and it's going to end up being replicated around the country. But it's you know it's California at its best. A an innovative online opportunity for people to move up the job ladder. Oh, that sounds great. I like the no tests idea myself. You know, <laughs> I appreciate all of that. Thank you for joining me today. Tom Epstein with the California Community College Board of Governors. Appreciate your time today, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Wait, don't leave yet. Hit subscribe. Make sure you get the weekly updates. We have a new episode every Wednesday for stuff happening in the East Bay. In the meantime, Follow me on LinkedIn, Jared Ash, or check out our firm where we have a weekly newsletter and blog at Capstone Government Affairs on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today on the Capstone Conversation.